evening, ladies and gentlemen and fellow staff. My name is Sarah Etheridge and I'm the director of the Stronic Regional Cancer Centre here at South Lake. We are delighted to welcome you to the continuation of our cancer lecture series. This is the fifth since the official opening of the Stronic Regional Cancer Centre almost a year ago now. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we start. Uh, there's refreshments over here on my left and the washrooms. The male washroom is straight out the door and down the corridor and the ladies washroom out of the door make a left before the elevators and on the other side of the elevators just make a right. The uh, topics chosen for these lectures are intended for general education uh, about cancer and to give insight into the expanding cancer care services now available, available locally and closer to home for the residents of Newmarket and surrounding areas. The uh, topics we select are often based on feedback we receive from completed evaluation forms. So therefore, I do encourage you all to complete this evening's evaluation form. You can either do it on paper or online. And if you need any more information, please drop by the reception desk on your way out and they can provide you with the uh, address for the internet uh, access. As many of you know, lectures are held on the last Tuesday of each month, except for December and over the summer months. Presentations are made by a number of highly skilled healthcare professionals covering the broad aspects of cancer care, including prevention, diagnosis, treatment and symptom management. They are also an effective way to learn more about the latest technologies and services offered by South Lake Regional Health Centre and the Stronic Regional Cancer Centre. There will be a question and answer period at the end of tonight's session. For tonight's presentation, I am delighted and privileged to introduce Dr. Woodrow Wells as our fifth guest speaker. The topic tonight is Love Your Skin, Skin Cancer Biology and Prevention. Dr. Wells is the lead physician for the Radiation Medicine Program at the Stronic Regional Cancer Center at South and South Lake Regional Health Center. Dr. Wells is also an assistant professor of radiation oncology at the University of Toronto. In 25 years of practice, Dr. Wells has gained a wide range of experience in radiation oncology. He is co-chair of the specialty committee of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, the body which sets standards for the training and practice of radiation oncology in, in Canada. Dr. Wells has led the program at the Rupstronic Regional Cancer Centre for the past year, uh, when he took over on the Ides of March, as he reminded me this evening. Dr. Wells is a keen proponent of patient-centered, evidence-based care. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Wells. So, thank you, Sarah, uh, and thank you all for coming. So these days, uh, doctors often begin these talks with a set of disclosures, and usually disclosures are about potential conflicts of interest. So I'll disclose that I have no conflicts of interest. I think I don't work for any sunscreen companies or endorse any particular kind of sunscreen. I will disclose that I had help from my colleagues in putting the ideas for this talk together. So uh, thank you for that. And I'll also disclose that the sound isn't high enough, right? Right. Just flip this oh, stick it on my tie. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Much better. Okay, so oh, I'll also disclose that as a radiation oncologist, I've treated hundreds and hundreds of people for skin cancer over the past 25 or 30 years. I don't know if I've ever prevented one. So there's a story uh, about medical education, which has lots of parallels to public education, that teaching medical students and young doctors how to practice medicine in a hospital is like teaching forestry in a lumber yard. The notion is that a lot of what we teach people has to be moved upstream, so the uh, strong message I'm going to give you tonight is less about the treatment of skin cancer and a fairly strong message, I hope, about prevention. So, uh, most of what I uh, have made up in these slides is pictures and examples of skin cancers from where I used to work for the past 25 years or so, but I did use the South Lake template, as you see. But I couldn't help but uh, teasing Matt that I've updated the South Lake template with uh, a new slide. <laughs> so the objectives of this talk are to acquaint you with uh, notions about what skin cancer is. We'll talk about melanoma, the one that scares most people, and then the vastly more common non-melanoma skin cancer. And we'll talk about 
the strategies and why it's so important to prevent skin cancer in the first place, what the costs are to people and society, and then we'll talk about treatment uh, strategies, although I'm not going to get a lot of details about treatment strategies because they all have to be individualized for people. And then I promise, uh, according to the tenets of public education, not to scare you with too many gory pictures and scary stories. Although, if you're an adolescent boy, apparently scary, gory, graphic pictures work the best. And we'll try not to make people feel too guilty. So, we will ask for some interactivity. So, if there's anything that's like dead stupid that I've said or that's not understandable, ask me a question. Um, and then we'll talk about the causes, the natural history of skin cancer, how big the burden is and prevention strategies, and then the five steps that I bet most of you know already, and then questions uh, more or less at the end. So how many cases of skin cancer were there in this country last year? So guess, any volunteers to guess how many melanomas were diagnosed in Canada last year? 5,000, okay, that's, uh, any other guesses? How does 5,000 strike you? Big, low. Now we're talking melanomas, right? Not garden variety skin cancer. That's next. So you're a well-informed participant. Uh, 5,300, according to the Canadian Cancer Society last year. So that's a lot. Um, and then non-melanoma skin cancers. Oh, hell, I gave it away too soon. 75,500 non-melanoma skin cancers. The garden variety ones, right? So... 30,000 people, uh, that's about uh, 25,000 in Ontario, and if you extract that central mid, we're fading in and out, uh, that's about 2,500 in the new market area. So that's a lot of skin cancer, right? And the thing about an episode of skin cancer not a discrete diagnosis and activity at a limited point in time. It's really just the beginning of a whole long rest of life story of being watched for skin cancer because once you've had one skin cancer, you're quite likely to get more. And both non-melanoma skin cancer predicts for melanomas and vice versa. So what's the burden to society in this country? And how does skin cancer fit into the other types of cancers we see? So melanoma in terms of incident or new cases in Canada is number five. So the big one's up here. This is for males, by the way, but for females you can substitute breast cancer for prostate cancer. And melanoma is there as number five, 3.2% of incident cases of all cancers last year. Which sounds like a very really small number, but it translates into about 560 deaths every year. So um, there's no actual statistics for non-melanoma skin cancer because by an accident of history, non-melanoma skin cancers are not reportable diseases the way every other skin cancer is. I think it was believed years ago that non-melanoma skin cancers didn't cause deaths and weren't such a serious problem. So that's why we have that issue. So um, this slide is about the growth of cancer problems generally in this country. So what you can see here is that the rising number of skin cancers we see in the country is related to the aging demographic. We're all getting older. So we move into that age where we get more cancers. And part of it is due to population growth. So both of these factors are conspiring in the York region to bring about a larger number of cancer cases overall, which is why we have the new cancer center here. So a lot of what you read on the internet anyway, uh, or even in print media about skin cancer comes from Australia. So everybody knows, or probably everyone here in the middle of February is thinking, I'd rather be sunny and warm. So of course in Australia it is vastly sunnier. And there's a lot of people there with very vulnerable skin. So this slide is from the um, skin prevention program in Australia. And it shows you a couple of things about the incidence of melanoma. They have double 
almost triple the number of melanomas that we have in North America because of their sun exposure. So for them, it's a real upfront public health issue. And so they spend a lot of time on trying to prevent it. And so I'm using some of their stats to show what lessons we can learn from the Australians. So this slide shows you a couple things about how men get it worse than women. And these are the incident new cases of melanoma over these years. And this continues to go up. And what you also notice is that the death rate for melanoma is flat, hasn't changed over the years. So that's reassuring, right? It means that all the excess new incident cases are generally caught while they're small and curable, so you don't die of it. But I don't know about you, I'd rather not get one in the first instance rather than get a small one and then spend the next 20 years wondering <laughs> if it be on the dying curve or the cured curve. So again, that importance of prevention. So this slide is about the, uh, the kinds of people who get melanoma. So men on the left, women on the right. And what you can see along the bottom is these are years that you were born. So at this end are people who were born turn of the century. So if you're really old, 100 years or a bit less, you're the really big problem. So older males are the real problem. And the problem is not quite as severe for women, um, but it speaks to well-known notions about um, men not asking for directions uh, and men not asking for advice on preventing their cancers or adopting the advice that they're given. Um, so what can we learn from the Australians, even if Canada, sadly, isn't Australia in the middle of February? Um, it's a bit of a stretch, but you know the ozone layer above us is melting. We're getting more and more sun exposure, which may be contributing to take us to Australia, so to speak. But two out of three people in that country get skin cancer every year. There are one million visits to family doctors every year in Australia for skin cancer. They have 20 million people. We have 30 million people. So even if we have uh, less skin cancer here, we probably have a million family doctor visits a year for skin cancer, which is an enormous <laughs> cost, right? They also spend more money treating skin cancer in Australia than any other kind of cancer. And um, outside of cities in Australia, melanoma is the biggest cancer problem they have. 60% of cancers in the countryside are melanomas. And so, again, we can see a few parallels in York region where in Newmarket at this hospital we see a lot of people coming to us from north of here where a lot of the screening messages are not getting through. So there's an important message for us from the Australians is to reach out to the people in the countryside, not just the people in town. And then it was brought up by one of the family doctors here today that, well, most of the risk is in people who are under 18, which is a truth, or a truth as we know it by statistical modeling, that most of the UV damage that the sun gives you happens before you're 18 and certainly by 21 years of age. So I was joking uh, before you all showed up that probably the people coming to this lecture are not the target audience we really need to speak to. So you're going to take the target message home to your children and your grandchildren. And I have a few ideas about that for uh, the end of the talk. So how does cancer and skin cancer compare to all of the other health issues we have in this country? So what you can see here is that cancer is about 30% of uh, deaths in Canada. Cardiovascular disease is about 30%. This number used to be 50, right? Uh, about 20 years ago, deaths from cardiovascular disease accounted for almost half of our deaths, but the cardiologists, the program that's uh, high profile here at Southlake has shrunk this number. So the fewer people that die of this live long enough to get this. So <laughs> cancer is still a huge and growing problem for us in Canada. Here's another very sobering statistic from the Canadian Cancer Society. And what it shows us is the cost of health care according to when you die. 
and I'm not going to turn around and look at it because the microphone's going to fade again. But what it shows us is that the most extreme costs for health care are in the last few months of life. And nothing is more true than with melanoma, where the costs of treating metastatic disease are enormous because conventional treatments don't really work for it. So we have this vast array of very, very expensive biochemical and immune modulating treatments that are hugely expensive and don't cure anybody. So if ever there's a place and a reason to move the story from treatment to prevention, it's in the case of skin cancer. It would save us a vast amount of money to say nothing of a vast amount of heartache. Um, and it's not just the cost in dollars to the health care system. And Got it. But there's an enormous cost to everyone around the patient, particularly the families and caregivers there who have to bring the patient, the families and the children who have to take a day off work to come, and then there's all those out of parking or out of pocket expenses like parking in our expensive car park. So it's an enormous cost, both directly and indirectly to society, and again, much of it's preventable. So how did we get to this state where skin cancer is such a growing burden? Again, um, who's uh, a bad guy. And this was when he looked good. I don't know the date on the picture, but I couldn't find any up-to-date pictures of George Hamilton. But a lot of our problem, isn't it, is cultural. It's our orientation towards what looks healthy. And we associate a suntan with being outdoorsy, athletic, and sporty. We associate it with nice holidays in exotic places. We associate a suntan with leisure time, right? Whereas if you go back a century, we associated suntans with being a peasant in the farm fields, right? And it was very unpopular then. So something changed, right? And something is different about our culture in the last hundred years. And there's a huge influence of celebrities and politicians to create this notion that a suntan is a healthy thing. But there's an interesting thing, a fact here. If you think about the concept of tan as looking healthy, it's about the appearance of health rather than the real risk avoidance behaviors that truly is not only for skin cancer, but for a lot of other cancers, whether it's avoidance of smoke or the kinds of diet that may promote cancer. So here's a question. Uh, this is my audience participation uh, slide. Why are these tanning beds even legal anymore? Does anyone want to voice a point of view on that? Yes. Uh, I was just speaking with my daughter today before I came. Yes. Oh my goodness. It is a regular thing. Teenagers in high school going regularly to tanning beds instead of studying <laughs> during their break periods. That's pretty amazing, pretty shocking. Now, I think there is legislation recently in Ontario that does limit the use or access to tanning beds to something like 18. But um, my point of view is we should just ban them all. Um, but it's not illegal to be stupid, and yes, it's hard to legislate um, intelligence, let alone morality. But um, if any of you feel like leading a public education campaign of another sort, there's a cause for you. Okay, so sunscreen. So what are the benefits of sunscreen and why do we use it? There probably is some reasonable evidence that using sunscreen will help us reduce the risk of melanoma, it's not so clear about non-melanoma skin cancer. What's this guy using his sunscreen for? Um, he's using it to prolong his exposure to the sun, right? So those sunscreens will stop us from turning red and painful, but they're going to continue, or it will allow us to continue to expose ourselves to the sun, and we're still going to accumulate a lot of UV damage. And so it's thought that blistering sunburns are related to melanomas where the constant steady exposure to UV light is causing the squamous carcinomas. So sunscreens are a mixed bag. They probably are helping against the sunburns and the melanoma risk, 
but they're also allowing a lot of other foolish behavior like this. Um, so childhood exposure, we've touched already on the notion that most of our dangerous exposure is before we're an adult, before we're conscious and able to make our own independent choices. So here's a beach picture of a grandmother who I'm sure loves her grandson very much, but look what's happening here, right? Um, she's not looking so good. Uh, a little wrinkly. Um, but there he is getting exposed to the sun. Lord knows if he's got sunscreen on. So I did hear a story once that in Australia, if you do that or let your kid do that, you'll get reported to the Children's Aid Society. I'm not sure if that's really true or not, but it's a, it's a thought to consider, right? Um, she probably wouldn't let him play in the street on Davis Drive, right? So yet she's letting him play on this uh, very dangerous beach. So it's thought, again, some kind of scientific mathematical modeling, which has a few errors built into it. But if we reduced exposure to kids like this till they're 18 or 21, we could reduce the risk of melanomas by 60 to 78 percent, which is a huge thing. You could practically eliminate deaths from melanoma between that and proper screening to catch them early. So. Um, we said there's a notion of pallor as a good thing, dating back to last century. Uh, maybe the vampires had it right, and maybe that whole notion about Twilight Zone movies should be played up. I didn't watch any of those movies, and they weren't too appealing to me, but they probably have a public health message built into them somehow that pallor would be a preferable notion. This guy, I think you may know, I think is Uncle uh, Hen... Fester? Fester from the Adams Family? One of those. I can never remember the difference between Adams Family and that other uh, TV show about the Munsters, yes. So um, lots of celebrities can have influence on how we behave in society. And I think it's too late for Mr. Berlusconi to have a whole lot of benefit on society at large. But he's also famous for his suntan, among other things that we won't mention here. But politicians can have a big impact on how people behave. And you know that if you scan the content of media, public media, about skin cancer, it's mostly about celebrities getting skin cancer and their experience with it, or some arcane bit of research, most of which is irrelevant to society at large. So I think we need to do a better job of having public media attention on skin cancer prevention um, and talks like this. So here's another European politician, a little less famous in Canada than Mr. Berlusconi. This is the, uh, the last prime minister of Belgium. Um, and so this was an ad campaign that they came up with for the, uh, the Euromelanoma campaign. They knew that it was the old men who got the worst melanomas, as you saw on that earlier slide, who did the least amount of responding to need for screening. So this campaign had the Prime Minister and a couple of his political cronies showing up and saying, melanomas can be lethal, get yours. So they actually were able to demonstrate in Europe that this campaign of these very attractive old men could actually influence people's um, showing up for screening. So if those guys can do it, just imagine if we put Paris Hilton up there to promote sunscreening, uh, we could do a world of good. Um, or perhaps Mr. Harper could uh, give up on being tough on crime and could get tough on sun exposure. So prevention strategies. We've already said that it's good of you all to come and listen to me tonight, but um, we need to kind of move things up the yum lumber yard and down in the forest and into the, um, the seedling forest, right? So the public education message needs to go to the kids. So we need messaging and public education in daycares and public schools because that's where kids' attitude about health care is often formed, right? And then we need to have a bit more of it to those teenagers, right? Because it's at the teenage years that they begin their intentional sunbathing as Mary pointed out about her daughter in public school or high school, is out there tanning because they think it's cool. So we need to change that message. And um, yes? I just have a question about 
the one when the kids are going away on holiday in the winter time. Yes. Um, is it better to have a series of four or eight sessions in the tanning salon rather than getting burned on the beach when you go there? Which is because you, you stay out too long in the sun. I mean, which is the worst of two evils? Yes. Uh, the question was about whether it's better for a youngster to take the trip to a sunny spot, get a blistering sunburn, or prime the skin with a bit of tanning bed protection before they go. I don't think there's any evidence to answer that question either way. Um, as I think I mentioned, I know knew very little about prevention, so I had to do a lot of homework, so I, I read a lot about that. And there really is no evidence about that. Uh, most experts will say there really is no safe tanning bed exposure. So I, I think the message isn't... I mean, in some ways it's almost like strategies of risk reduction for drug injection um, or HIV exposure, that there are some controversial strategies, but there's no perfectly safe scenario. So I have to say I don't know the answer, but nothing I've read suggests that there's any safe tanning bed exposure. And certainly tanning bed exposure before the age of 18 has been linked to the occurrence of melanoma. But an interesting corollary, if I can divert that question a little bit, is there's also an excess of melanoma in airline pilots. And so it poses an interesting question. Is it the UV light or UV exposure they get from being high in the stratosphere? Or is it the fact that they are also taking their pale skin intermittently to sunny destinations and getting this intermittent exposure to sunburns that's causing the melanoma? And the, um, the preponderance, of, preponderance of opinion seems to be on the latter, that it's that intermittent exposure. So I think no one could encourage those kids to do a little bed prep just to avoid it altogether. Um, so the other place we need to have it is in those um, tourist locations, so in the arrivals hall in the Caribbean and the arrivals hall in all of those sunny places. And we could probably have some public education in occupational settings like this place at the onset of summer holiday season could probably change the posters in the elevators to the sun protection message. So Matt's told me he's going to take care of that. And I always say in terms of any kind of healthcare uh, messaging, if you can't hook them on the need to promote health, hook them on vanity, right? If you can kind of link sun exposure to looking old and wrinkly, that might be the way to motivate people to change their behavior. Um, Primary prevention, you know, working with kids is mostly where we're at. We kind of talked about these things. I don't think anyone needs to be told what these five strategies are. Put a hat on, put protective clothing on, uh, stay out of the sun when it's um, 10 a.m. to uh, um, 4 p.m. And uh, uh. Wear sunscreen, 30 or higher, and it's probably not a matter of fussing about what the right number is. It's about finding a product that you find agreeable and just using it all the time. And then my personal take on a lot of this is it's often about reminding people about personal responsibility to take charge of your own health because certainly the system as it is is not really structured to protect us all. Your family doctor, um, is it fair to say, probably isn't going to examine your skin every time you go unless you ask him or her to. So we all have to be mindful to make that responsibility our own rather than put it on to our doctors in the healthcare system to catch all these things, let alone remind us about things we need to do. And then secondary prevention is the case of what we do for people who've already been identified as high risk or having another a prior skin cancer. But most of these needs for secondary prevention don't apply to the vast majority of people because the vast majority of our population has not had a kidney transplant or some other organ transplant or find themselves on this high risk. So most of it's about primary prevention, the important meat of the matter is in primary prevention and in young kids. Uh, so what happens when prevention fails? It's uh, where we get melanomas from. So who gets melanomas? 
It's people with a family history of melanoma, people who have a prior history of melanoma, people who have lots and lots of moles, particularly if they're dysplastic or atypical looking moles, and I'll show you what they look like. Um, you can all undress at the end of the story if you like. Uh, people with high sun exposure in childhood, people with pale skin, blue eyes, blonde hair, or red hair, history of blistering sunburns, and sunbed use in the early years. So many things in medicine have mnemonics to help us remember them, and ABCDs belong to all sorts of things. So the ABCDs of melanoma are moles or pigmented things that look asymmetrical, that are irregular, color variation, big diameter, bigger than a quarter of an inch or six millimeters if you're metric, and ones that have elevations or enlargement. And there are other uh, lists, Glasgow lists to remember them. So here's some examples of melanomas that show the asymmetry of the lesion. Here's a big ugly spot on a, a flatter macule. Here's the border irregularity and I think you can see that around these things, these larger lumpy things, the pigment is bleeding into the surrounding skin. That's certainly a sign of um, atypicality, if not overt tumor. Here's a picture of color variation, and here is one that shows you the six millimeters and that the large lesions that you have to worry about. Uh, the atypical lesions can look a lot like this. So that's the problem of melanoma. Um, the, sli or the column on the right are melanomas, and these are benign pigmented lesions. So there was a woman that trained me a long time ago who was a dermatopathologist and also a dermatologist. So few people would know more than she did what it looked like on the patient's skin and what it really was under the microscope. And she always used to say, I never know. Things that look really ghastly can be benign, and things that look benign can actually turn out to be melanoma. So her rule of thumb uh, that I've adopted is if it worries the doctor or worries the patient, have it off. Um, so that's a good rule of thumb. It's just that you can't invoke that rule of thumb for people like me who have hundreds of uh, spots. So you have to use some judgment in terms of when and how to get the uh, spots off. So it's an uncertainty problem. So what's the treatment of melanoma? Usually the treatment is surgery, surgery, surgery. Remove it with a border of one to two centimeters. The deeper and thicker it is, the wider the border should be. And nowadays, when we can do it conveniently, there's a procedure called sentinel node biopsy where you inject a little radioactivity into the primary site and it tells you where the draining lymph nodes are. We use this all the time in breast cancer. So then if there is a positive lymph node on the sentinel biopsy, you'll do a full node dissection. Or if you can actually feel the lymph nodes at the beginning, you'll do a node dissection. And then for thick melanomas or ones that have positive lymph nodes or other adverse high-risk features, the standard treatment in Ontario is interferon, which is an unpleasant treatment that makes you feel like you have the flu for a year. There's a whole variety of other adjuvant therapies. Uh, I had a patient who had the wherewithal to shop all over North America for opinions on his melanoma. And he got five different stories at all the uh, five big places. So there's no perfect therapy uh, to improve your odd survival for melanoma. Uh, but the current standard in Ontario is interferon. Uh, radiotherapy is seldom used in melanoma, except that you have extensive lymph node involvement at the time. Uh, and radiation is also used for palliation of melanomas. Um, so I'm going to shift on to the less scary tumors. They're less scary, but they're no less ugly. So this is an example of my first garden variety non-melanoma skin cancer or basal cell carcinoma. These two examples are in typical locations on the nose. Uh, if the lights were a little lower, you can see there's a pearly nodular lesion on the nasal vestibule. And here's another typical example above the eyebrow. You can see the central ulceration, pearly nodular stuff. So that's the kind of thing you're on the watch for. Here are a whole bunch of examples of more typical basal cell cancers. One on the eyelid. Again, you can see this pearliness and nodularity. 
Here's an example of an ulcerated one with the nickname rodent ulcer because it's burrowing through the skin. And it shows another typical example of basal cells with this spidery blood vessels that we call telangiectasias. Um, basal cells can be superficial and flat, look like that, and then basal cells can occasionally be pigmented, confusing a little bit with melanoma. So those are typical examples and typical locations for basal cells. It's said on average, basal cells occur in the central part of the face. The other squamous cells that I'll get to occur on the periphery of the face. So there's an advanced basal cell carcinoma. I think this lady came and had had it for about a year. So you can see it's eroding into the bridge of her nose and creating this big, huge nodule. And it's eroding into her nasal lacrimal gland about to obstruct the um, nasal lacrimal duct. So that's a big, nasty one. And fortunately for me, she insisted on having surgery because that would be a very tough place to give her radiation. So basal cells are the most common skin cancer we see. They're the most common skin cancer of all. They rarely spread. They rarely are a threat to life, but they can certainly be a threat to your beauty, as you saw there. And about one in three of us will get this. Two in three people in Australia will get it. 80% um, of them are on the head and neck region, so that speaks to the fact that it's day-to-day -day exposure, right? Um, everyone with skin cancer says, oh, I never laid around the pool, I never went sunbathing, right? Sunbathing is where you lay like that first guy, totally exposed in a bathing suit, but the head and neck location is the day-to-day -day exposure, so it's the day-to-day -day application of sunscreen and protection that we have to focus on, not the occasional time, mostly, that you go to the pool. Mostly preventable, but if you have to treat it, um, the treatment is going to be from the dermatologist. That's the curatage, which basically means scrape it off and use a little cautery to um, sterilize the base. Or else it's simple surgical excision from your plastic surgeon, which is pretty quick and easy, a 10-minute procedure. Usually a pretty nice scar, depending on where it is. Mohs surgical dissection is a technique of cutting it checking the margin around uh, the perimeter with a microscope to be sure it's clear, and you keep cutting until the margins are all clear. And this allows you to remove as little uh, tissue, normal tissue, as possible, so it's useful in very tight spots, like around the nose <coughs> or around the eyelid. So spaces where you can remove lots of tissue easily, you don't go to the bother of a Mohs procedure. And then the last treatment is radiation therapy, which we reserve for places where surgery is not possible or certain locations where the surgery might be disfiguring like the nose or the eyelid. Um, topical creams are sometimes used. Imiquad is the generic name and Eldara is the cream and it's only useful for very superficial ones and would be considered experimental because the duration of effectiveness is not as long as it is for the standard surgery and radiation treatments. So I should just note that the treatments for squamous carcinomas, which we'll show you some examples of, are really the same. It's surgery or radiation treatment as curative modalities. You can't use the simple creams for squamous carcinomas. So what's the difference between a basal cell and a squamous cell? We get that question a lot. So Basal cells tend to be rather polite-looking tumors. Round, well-circumscribed, don't look nasty, tend to be growing outwards, whereas the squamous cells are ugly-looking things. They're invasive, erosive. They often produce a lot of inflammation, this redness around the periphery, and they can erode the tissues and be quite destructive. And these inward-growing tumors do have metastatic potential, not high, but about 5% of these will spread into lymph nodes, whereas basal cells, there's no lymph node involvement except in the rarest of cases. So here's a, another couple of examples of squamous carcinomas on the skin. Again, you can see it's a rather more peripheral location. Here's one on the lip, which perhaps isn't peripheral, but um, this guy was probably a pipe smoker. It looks like a classic example of a pipe smoker's squamous on the lip. 
a couple of, uh, I had to put in one gross picture of a very destructive squamous carcinoma on a woman. Here's one on a guy. Um, and this wasn't last century, you know. This happened a couple of years ago, and the guy was a forklift driver who, um, I don't know, just didn't get out much, and it was only when his daughter dragged him in that he came with this very destructive lesion. Um, so that still happens. Here's an equally ugly one on the scalp that I treated with radiation, and it went away, so good outcomes are possible. Um, the guy had a pretty good outcome, too. Um, you know, your mother told you to wash behind your ears, so the sunscreen needs to go behind your ears. Better yet, sunscreen plus a hat that protects your ears. There's a really nasty one behind the ear. And then here's a recurrent nasty squamous on a guy's cheek. And I decided I'd put this one in. Uh, this picture goes back to 2001 when I saw him and treated him. And when I, I went downtown to make this talk on Friday, and I ran into this guy in the elevator, and I went, oh, so nice to see you. And he was back because he didn't listen to the other message about not smoking, so he was being treated for a, a cancer of the larynx now. Um, but here you can see at least that we managed to cure his skin cancer with the radiation treatment, and I'm pleased to tell you that even a decade later, his cheek looked pretty good. <laughs> but his voice was a little hoarse, poor guy. So uh, even the more aggressive squamous cancers can be cured with pretty good outcomes. Um, and then here is another variation of squamous carcinoma on the ear uh, that had the best treatment of all. It was a spontaneous resolution. This was a rare variant of squamous carcinoma called keratoacanthoma, which occasionally will spontaneously resolve. So I have this photo as a trick for the resident doctors in training because this looks a lot like late radiation scarring, but in fact, it was just resolution of the tumor spontaneously. So uh, I think I've tried to make the point here that skin cancers um, are a big, big public health problem. They cost our society a lot. They cost families a lot. Uh, they cost a lot of avoidable <coughs> disfigurement. Um, and they're not to be feared, right? But they are a real nuisance and a costly nuisance. And I think we need to focus on better strategies for getting the information and the behavioral modification to a younger audience. And as I was typing that line, I'm thinking, how do we reach that younger audience? You know? And then I went, ah, oh, duh, Facebook. So um, I think there needs to be a few more Facebook campaigns uh, about sun avoidance in that demographic, and the message might get across. You can't, of course, log on to Facebook from the hospital. No. The answer is, can you get a sunburn through glass? And the answer is no, that the glass filters out UV light. I just had my house renovated not so long ago, and ordinary panes of glass, I was told, will um, filter out about 85% of UV light. And if you want to pay extra to protect your art collection, you can get glass that filters out 98% of the UV light. So pretty difficult to get a sunburn through glass, or a significant sunburn. Um, some of the radiation that is in the sky is not just coming through the glass, it's coming through the aluminum. So there's gamma radiation up there. But it's an unresolved question whether the pilot story is really about the exposure up in the sky or the, pi the exposure once they land on the ground. Did you not get a suntan through the car window? Nope. Don't think so. Uh, as I say, if you stayed there a long, long time, you get some UV through the glass. But if ordinary glass shields out 85%, um, you probably have to be in your windscreen for a long, long time to get the sun exposure, right? Now, the arm out the open window is a different story. So, but by and large, I think the answer is no. There's also um, these creams that you can put on your skin to bring out your melanin and give you a color of tan. Is that... 
um, the question was about creams that you put on your skin to bring out your melanin. So um, there's probably a lot of creams out there that I don't know about, but if you're asking about the spray-on tan, or uh, it prevents the kids from going to get a tan, you know, for the vanity purposes. Yes. So this is what they're going to do with the placement of the sun itself. Yeah. So do you recommend that? Well, I don't know if I'm in an authority position to recommend those things or not, but they're probably reasonable products. Um, I, when I was think, I was thinking, the, I was anticipating the question about the L'Oreal products and whatnot that you kind of smooth on a cream that turns you into a dark. I've never read that those products evoke your, or stimulate your own melanin. They just give you a color. Um, but I don't know. And I would be quite cautious about that question because I do know that there are lots of creams out there. This brings out an interesting question about cultural attitudes to color. And so in parts of the world, being darker is equated with being you know, less attractive, right? And so in large swaths of the world, like Asia, there are creams to whiten you, enlighten you, and even out your pigmentation. And even now, a lot of those creams contain arsenic because that's a good way to make you light. And that, of course, will give you skin cancer. Um, so I think the, I certainly don't know the answer to that question if those creams are safe and I wouldn't be recommending them. Uh, I think you have to read very carefully what the contents are. Um, but uh, again, it's that risk reduction strategy. Is it a tanning bed or a trip to Mexico or is it a bit of cream that has a bit of, you know, dye in it? It's probably better off. <coughs> The question is about microdermabrasion um, and can it reduce the risk of skin cancer. Um, my understanding of that question is no, because the damage has occurred at much deeper levels in the skin than microdermabrasion is going to affect. Uh, again, I'm not a dermatologist, so I don't know much about chemical peels, but I can just say from basic principles, it's the same story. Um, if a chemical peel has gotten down to the basal levels of your skin, uh, no one's going to go back for it. So I think the answer is no. <laughs> that, that's just the outer layers of skin. We'll go to this side of the room. Um, is, there a, is there a fairly high instance of people getting it in the back of the neck and thinking with a cap? And yep. So, uh, if you go to uh, any websites about sun protection, the instruction is a hat that shields your ears and the back of your neck. So lots of skin cancers occur on the back of the neck. So you need to protect that place as well. No, actually, the, sen the question was about where do you get Mohs microsurgery, and the, the location for that is at Women's College Hospital, so just across the road. Uh, no, it's a, it's a very specialized procedure, very operator dependent, so it's, it's done pretty uncommonly. So um, it's only recently that the government even pays for it, so like everything the government does, they kind of want to all access, and one way they do it is by um, controlling where it gets done. Uh, so those of us who make the oil in our 20s and add iodine and that's work, should we be checking carefully? You should be checking carefully. Uh, you would be in that category where secondary prevention is important, so risk of checking yourself. So. Um, Yes, that, that you need to do that and have your family check the bits on the back that you can't see, right? Yes. Um, I just, as humans, I feel that we're hardwired to get benefits from the sun. I mean, yes. We've been living on this planet for thousands of years. Um, are we in danger of overprotecting our children? There's, there are benefits from sunlight, vitamin D and the like. And, or, you know, I worry about chemically keeping the sun away and then chemically giving vitamin D and it. Doesn't seem right somehow. Yes. So the question is, are we 
overreacting, are we overprotecting ourselves from the sun, um, especially if we do it in the chemical ways? So uh, I think it's a valid point. I'll take the vitamin D question first. Everyone, I think, knows that vitamin D is good for preventing all sorts of diseases, including cancer. Um, but you need very few minutes of exposure of arms and face to get most of the vitamin D you need in the sunny parts of the year. And you know, you can take a pill. Um, and you know, is it 500 deaths from melanoma? Or you know, you can't believe how cheap a big, big bottle of vitamin D is. And we know, unlike lots of other vitamins that were the vitamin du jour that we then found out was unsafe, like vitamin E, vitamin D has been in use to treat osteoporosis in women for decades, right? So there are women who've taken vitamin D for a long, long time, and we know that that's not a dangerous vitamin, and that you, you know, basically no one's going to overdose on that vitamin. And then to answer the other part of your question about the protection message, most of them are not chemical things, right? Wear a hat, long sleeves, don't be out in the noonday sun like a mad dog. These are just common sense behaviors that it's just a matter of um, just doing them for ourselves, right? So when I take my little grandchildren, my babies, to the beach this summer, lather them in sunscreen and put clothing on them because you people are there for hours and hours and hours yeah. you know if you go well uh, it's cool okay so i'll answer that question with this slide this is a slide from the australian media campaign this says backyard cricket games pool party tennis with friends outdoor concert barbecue at sam's surgery couldn't get all the cancer it's a bit harsh but you know we can borrow from other people's harsh experience, right? Because we could be going there. So my question for you and audience engagement is what are you going to do differently starting this summer or this spring season? So I think, yes, uh, you're going to at the least cover those kids with sunscreen. Yes, you're going to let them learn to swim. And when they come out of the water, you'll cover up. You'll maybe sit in the tree shady bit at the back, and then you'll set an example for other people, right? Um, you'll um, insist that there be shady areas in playgrounds, like if you drive around and look at schools and public parks, are the swings in a shady area or are they out in the open sun? I mean, there's advocacy that we can all undertake there. Um, I think the messaging, you know, shouldn't be a fearful one for children, right? It's just letting them adopt the behaviors that it's natural to wear a hat, it's natural to wear some sunglasses, especially on the beach, and not natural to lie out like that one thing. Oh, hat, protective clothing, um, sunscreen, sunglasses. Oh, that's sunscreen. Oh, that's a shady place. That's a tree with shade, and that's the, um, the sunscreen. Uh, okay. I was just going to say, have you noticed that, um, in your research about the cosmetic industry now, over the years have started putting in you know, 15%? Yes, sunscreen's in everything. So, have you noticed with women versus men in your research that a lot of it is in moisturizers for women use all the time versus, I know a lot of men are doing it now, but it's not so much in the last two years. Um, I, I haven't perceived any difference um, since the advent of sunscreen and vitamins and everything. Um, and the statistics would kind of belie that. Um, it's still happening a lot in men because there might be some metro types using all those products out there, but there's a whole lot that aren't getting the message and aren't covering up. Uh, yep. Uh, I don't know that there's any evidence that there's much difference between the brands. Um, most uh, government-sponsored websites or these websites that I talked about here would advocate 30 or higher. But I think in terms of our own behavior or our family's behavior, it isn't so much fussing about the number, whether it's 
15 or 30 or 45, it's doing it all the time. And from May till September, just putting it on every day so that they, the dermatologists do say it builds up in your skin. So if you forget a day, you have some carryover protection. And it's finding a product that you find agreeable, right? Some sunscreens sting a bit, especially the gel types, and people don't use it. So it's finding one that you like. And I always think that um, the Costco thing, I don't work for Costco either, but you can get gallon sizes at my cottage. There's gallon sizes of that stuff from Costco or some cheap place, and the kids just get dipped in it, right? So it's more a matter of making it available uh, and encouraging people to use it. Not so much what brand. Is the prevalence of skin cancer about the same in the black population as in the Caucasian population? Um, I think the answer is no. There certainly is a known correlate between the amount of natural pigment you have in your skin and the incidence of skin cancer. So it's a lot lower, but it's not unknown. And amongst the black population, they are still of the melanomas. So uh, we sometimes talk about Bob Marley disease. He's a very famous black singer who died of a melanoma that began under his fingernail. So the melanoma story is there. Um, Non-melanoma skin cancer is much less, but it's not unknown. In my slide collection, I have a couple of pictures of a black person with uh, skin cancer on their face. <coughs> ah, yes. I just want to make a plea for people to start checking at a younger age, the last two patients that I saw that had basal cell skin cancers were in the 30s. Yep. Yep, that's an important point, an observation, more than a question about checking earlier that skin cancer is appearing in family doctor's offices in the 30s. I've certainly seen people who are 30s uh, with skin cancers. Um, I've certainly seen 18 and 19 year olds with melanomas and not the good ones necessarily either. So yes, it's a, it's a message for the screening and as well as the prevention to go into a younger age group. So uh, how are you going to spread the word this summer, this spring? Anybody. You can volunteer. Uh, I, sh I will. I'm a volunteer at the hospital. I will ask people if they're putting their sunscreen on come April. Are they wearing it? I will uh, spread it through my daughter and her Facebook. I'm on Facebook. She's on Facebook. Facebook's good. Um, yeah, I have to confess, I've never been on Facebook. Uh, I saw the movie. So I know it's powerful. Um, influences a lot. So we need either a revolt or a revolution uh, on Facebook about skin protection. Yeah. You have a teenager. Whoa. Yes, the observation was about what young adolescents, particularly male ones, respond to. And as I say, that is known in the public education literature that uh, graphic scary messages are how you get to young boys. Um, I guess if they've been desensitized with all those video games, that's the only way to get past their fear. I showed him stains that he could get if he didn't brush the teeth of his braces, and he is an avid brusher now. And I took a picture of one in the bathroom wall. And so maybe it would work if you show them A gruesome picture of skin cancer, yeah. The nose one, the nose one yeah. Not so attractive. So... It's interesting, Australian Open, the uh, children, the bull boys or girls, had actually really big hats on all the way down the back. They had long sleeves on, and it was really, really hot. And I was thinking, wow, why are they so covered? But obviously, it's a big thing in Australia. And I suppose if you make it look fashionable, then that's how they will get over it. But they were totally covered. It was really interesting. Did you hear that at the Australian Open recently? The ball boys 
were all covered with uh, what looked like uncomfortable hats. But it tells us that the public health message is getting through. In fact, the Australians say that for every dollar they invested in public health education about skin cancer, they get back $2.32 in cost savings by treating less skin cancer. One, one other thing to that. Uh, I remember being there in 83 and being there in 90. And uh, I was there a couple of months each time. And, and the second time I noticed in Queensland, the northeast section, that the kids all wore the hats and gloves and play at noon hour and that. And if they didn't have the hat, they didn't, they didn't buy it. That's it. Well, that was quite over 20 years ago. Was that the teachers uh, invoking that they behavior? The, or the, the children parents, too? Uh, they, they have to go with hats and everything they use yeah. In seven years, there was a lot of, a lot of change. You know. Yeah, yeah. So something to be learned from the Australians for sure. Yeah. yeah. I think that's the answer there. You make it fashionable, go wear it. Yeah. I think, you know, uh, apart from Facebook, you know, you get in touch with the fashion industry <coughs> and, and make your bit there. Right? They'll wear what's fashionable. Yep. Well, you do see occasional rock stars with those goofy little hats on, and you sort of wonder, do they just do that because they like the hats, or has someone got to them for the purpose of messaging the youth? But I don't know. But we still have a ways to go in dispersing that behavior. Yes? In terms of family history, um, my mother-in-law's had melanoma three times now. So are there special checks that sons of grandsons or granddaughters should do? Um, well, yes. Uh, so you can go to a dermatologist for inspection of pigmented lesions, and certainly the family history is significant. Uh, it raises the risk in first degree relatives a lot. So, yes, they probably should go to their family doctor and possibly to a dermatologist to look at those moles, and any of them that look suspicious should be removed. If you remove them, does that take away the chance that you will get cancer? Uh, are we talking about, the question is about removing them, does it take away the risk? So if you're talking about a pigmented lesion, like a mole, or what we commonly call moles, there is that slide at the beginning of incidence of melanomas going up, 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 but death rate being flat. So statistically for a population, if you remove them early enough, you'll cure them. But for an individual, you don't know if that statistic applies to you or not. So even thin superficial ones that are cured by surgery can still come back. And my record for a recurrence of melanoma was 20 years. So you have to wait a long time to know that you're lucky and that the surgery cured you. So hence the reason for leaning on the prevention story. Well, going once, going twice, that's the last question. Thank you for your attention, and um, be sensible.